What are some of the basic recent developments in neuroscience that help us understand religious experience? Hmm. Well, there's, there's so many it's hard to know where to begin. I think one of the big ones that a lot of um, cognitive neuroscientists refer to is this developing con conception of the theory of mind capacity. And all that that means is human beings um, attributing agency just everywhere. You know, that there are other minds out there in the world and in the universe, and apparently there's, there's a, a set of networks in the brain, neuron networks in the brain that are specifically devoted to processing other minds and uh, intentions and detecting agency here and there. So a lot of uh, cognitive neuroscientists have made the claim, which I don't completely agree with, but have made the claim that one of the big sources of um, positing supernatural agents in the universe is this overactive theory of mind device, you might say. And they call it the hyperactive agency detection system. So even for extraterrestrial life? and Yeah, just seeing agency everywhere. You know, it's a, um, if you, a cloud formation might look like um, a face sometimes. And then a uh, primitive man might have said, hey, there's a, there's a big person up there in the sky. Then that big person up in the sky becomes a god. So the story goes. And, and my own... Uh, opinion is that, um, yes, obviously this theory of mind capacity, this capacity to attribute intentionality to other human beings, and sometimes unseen entities, spirit beings or animals or just other um, agents, must be one source of religious experience. And so to that extent, that's a contribution to understanding religion mm -hmm. and religious experience, you know. It, one source of um, our beliefs in supernatural agents has to be this sort of theory of mind capacity. Mm -hmm. So, okay, that's, that's great, that's good, that's some progress, but it's not the whole story. But that, you know, if you ask me what are some of the major contributions coming from the cognitive sciences and the neurosciences towards religious study, that's one of them. Mm -hmm. um, so if you were to say, or if, if you were to compare the 1970s and what we knew in neuroscience then to now, is there just a real gap in advancement and yes. achievement since that period? Huge. Huge. And of course, uh, uh, that gap um, is largely attributable to advances in techniques. Um, <clears throat> in all of the modern neuroimaging technologies come online in the mid-late 80s, and then really took off in the 90s and the 2000s. And they've revolutionized our understanding of brain activation patterns and brain functions. So, and then there's just a whole, and then there's been the genetics revolution. I mean, and just all of the brain sciences have been revolutionized in the past 20 years. So, and that has to have a huge impact on how we understand the mind and behavior. It was amazing to me from your book that William James had been on to some of this. Oh yeah. You know, a hundred years ago, or more than a hundred years ago, but it was just so primitive. Uh, the, the field it didn't really exist, did it? I mean, or there, no. it was just in as an idea, or just a bunch of um, you might say clinical observations. You know the. He, he was a very astute observer, so mm -hmm. he would say, okay, here's, here's somebody with a, a certain pattern of brain damage, and look at their religiosity changed dramatically. Mm -hmm. And here's somebody who inhaled nitric oxide, and their relig religiosity changed dramatically. Mm -hmm. So clearly, when you do something to the brain, the person's self-report of his own religiosity changes dramatically. And then there, you know, down through the centuries, there's always been these um, references to the sacred disease, you know, some form of epilepsy. So, you know, people have known for centuries that you, you, you do something to the brain and you get very different expressions of religiosity depending on how you perturb the brain. So the brain has something to do with religious experience. And, you know, mm -hmm. James could see that. It seems obvious. Mm -hmm. 
And he was, but he was, he very wisely said, pointed out to philosophers and neurologists at the time that just because you get um, a change in religiosity patterns, because you get a, a knock on the brain, doesn't mean that religiosity is reducible to those brain activation patterns. Mm -hmm. Now they're they're correlated. Some, they have something to do with one another, but the brain doesn't necessarily cause religious experiences. It, it allows, you could say, uh, the brain <clears throat> allows certain types of experiences to occur, to be manifest. And certainly there's a whole strand in um, theology that suggests that's, that's how we should understand brain and religion. Mm -hmm. Can I ask you something about, we had talked before um, a little bit about the, uh, the connect or the disconnect really between the hard sciences and say neuroscience and religious studies and the humanities, the, the history of religion. Um, what do you think accounts for that, that, that uh, chasm that exists there between these fields? Hmm. Well, I think probably a lot of it is just laziness. You know, people in each discipline, it, I mean, it's, it's so hard to stay abreast of your own discipline. You know, how can a neuroscientist who has to stay abreast of so much stuff that just every week, you know, there's, there's something absolutely fundamentally important being published every single week. How do you stay abreast of that and learn the methods of the historian of religions mm -hmm. or learn the methods of the comparative religionist? or learn any theology. And then, you know, people in the sciences, I think they're, it, 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 it's not an overstatement to say that they almost become indoctrinated with um, the view that theology is just an absolute waste of time, you know, because it's a bunch of pontificating about nothing. It's yeah. Totally speculative. And yeah, they, you know, it's you, you, textbooks in the, in the sciences, right from the undergraduate level to the graduate level is um, um, pushing people to adopt mechanical uh, or methodological materialist perspectives and say, look, we, we don't know what's going on in, in the heavens or if God exists or anything else. Forget all that. Just assume there's nothing but matter and go from there. And, and that seems a, you know, a fair piece of advice to me. You have to do that. Uh, but that, you know, influences thinking in the hard sciences with respect to theological speculations and, and um, philosophy of religion and religious studies. You know, that it's all about, it's much ado about nothing. But that's, that arrogant attitude um, doesn't um, make it easy for hard scientists to cooperate with people in the humanities who really know something about religion. Mm -hmm. So there's that problem, and then there's the opposite problem in the other direction, where people in the humanities uh, think that all scientists are nothing but re uh, idiot reductionists. You know, maybe there's a lot of scientists who are, but once you, once scientists really start to grapple with a phenomena, they may they may cite all these crazy mechanical materialist reductionist philosophical presuppositions, but in practice, they're usually really open to the array of phenomena before them because they, they want to explain it. So it forces them to open up their minds a little bit and, and, and say, okay, well, yes, maybe everything can be explained just in terms of um, um, brain and matter, but, uh, you know, I'm going, to have to, I'm going to have to open up my mind a little bit more because consciousness, for example, it's really difficult to explain when you just adopt this mechanical materialist mindset. Mm -hmm. 